I think that this conflict is essentially different for both Armenians and Azerbaijan and there are multiple reasons for that. First of all, since the moment when the previous Nagorno-Karabakh conflict ended in the 90s, Armenians took the control of the territory they wanted and secured the safety of the people living there. And Azerbaijan is the one who lost the war that time. So as you see, as I wrote in my post before, these two nationalisms on Armenian side and on Azeri side are completely different because here on the Armenian side is built entirely on the idea of defense. However, within Azerbaijan is built entirely on the idea of conquer. And the, I think that one of the reasons why I never really heard the hate speech here in education during my years as a teacher is that uh, there is no need in Armenia for such speech. And Armenia has never been hostile to Azerbaijan in a very direct way. We see this on the other side uh, quite frequently. Another difference here is that uh, Azerbaijan currently has very strong allies. And I think that uh, one of the reasons why we had to wait for 30 years for this to happen is that it needed also time to form strong alliances. Uh, Armenia currently, I have this feeling unfortunately, is fighting this um, war alone. And I don't see any adequate response from the international opinion so far. Usually in Europe when we, when we hear about two countries fighting over territory, we imagine this territory as inhabited equally by the two populations and then there is a contest here. However, we have to really take into consideration that this is the area completely inhabited by Armenians. Um, so when I hear this notion of liberation of Nagorno-Karabakh by, by Azerbaijan, I think the question I would ask um, as an anthropologist is that what exactly or who exactly you wish to liberate um, in this context, because there are no Azeri people there, there is no one to defend there contrary to the Armenia who has 150,000 people there who live there and who, who, who demand and who deserve to be protected. There, are always, there is always some amount of people on both sides who's gonna uh, be against the war. We have to really start reframing it that we are talking about Azerbaijan and Turkey on that other side. Is that probably everyone who has been uh, presenting anti-war or pro-Armenian rhetoric in this country is currently either dead or in jail or living outside of the country. So we don't really hear many of these voices there simply because it's completely unsafe to vocal this kind of opinions there. And you know, if we compare the freedom of press index in Armenia and in Azerbaijan, it's obviously completely different. This country does not have free press any longer uh, and I think that international opinion must also fully acknowledge that. I'm very far from framing this narrative as the Christianity and Islam opposition because I believe that there is nothing in Christianity itself and Islam itself uh, that would make this um, mutually exclusive. It's about how the Islam or Christianity is used on the foundation of the nationalist narrative. And I think that I, I saw sometimes on social media how many people frame it as the clash of civilizations understood as the Christianity versus Islam. And I understand why this rhetoric is convenient sometimes. However, it is in a way the clash of civilization, but not between Christianity and Islam, but between two different visions of the world and two different visions of politics, uh, having Azerbaijan and Turkey as a, and I have to say it out loud, fascist states who are trying to use Islam as a tool and who are trying to basically crave the rest of the world accordingly to own image. And I think that we have to seriously worry about it. And I worry about this as a European and I worry about this as a um, basically citizen of, of any countries and I think this is something that everyone should be concerned with. We have seen before Hagia Sophia being changed to a mosque, we have seen um, academics, almost 6,000 academics being uh, fired in Turkey and 700 from 2016 for the coup in 2016 being in jail. 
we see the recent tension um, between Turkey and Greece. So I think this is something that everyone should be content now taking into account that the Greece is the part of European Union and this is something that we should all be worried about. The Aliyev's family for 30 years sustained the power mainly, not only, but also thanks to the anti-Armenian rhetoric that has been basically pumped in the society for 30 years. So they raised the entire generation of, of Azerbaijani people who do not know war, who's been born after the war. And the only thing that they know after, about that war is what they have been told by the Azerbaijani government. So this narrative that has been so strongly imposed in Azerbaijan is now striking back because this, this generation of Azeri people actually demands war now. And uh, Aliyev's family has to put everything at stake at this moment to claim military victory because military victory is what is demanded from it. First, the safety has to be secured and the safety of the Armenian people and people in Nagorno-Karabakh has been proven not to be the priority of the international community for the past more than 100 years. Because, um, unfortunately, um, international community does fail Armenia because of the geopolitical significance of Armenia at this point. Unfortunately, we live in the world where the monetary interest is the one that, that prevails in, on the level of international treaties and international politics. So, as Armenia does not have any valid resources that could be offered to the rest of the world as the leverage, it has to stand alone. It's very interesting now to observe how the international position of Azerbaijan is going to be affected internationally and we have multiple evidence at this moment of violating uh, various rules of international law and how do you actually conduct war. We have UN Convention against uh, recruiting, training and the use of mercenaries that has been violated. We already have the evidence of Azerbaijan uh, basically targeting civilian uh, population. The problem that we face with the contemporary world is that it claims to be built up on a certain set of values, though these values are not fully implemented. So having observed uh, what happened in Syria and before, what happened with many conflicts that we face um, on the international level for the past 50 years or 100 years, is that what worries me a lot is that the, the values that the West declares uh, are not fully implemented with integrity at the level of international politics. And Azerbaijan has a big level here as here a, as a one of the oil suppliers to, to Europe. Uh, with uh, a lot of companies, big companies being involved, including Exxon, including British Petroleum. So I guess uh, we have to see which values will stand and we have to see is the world really ruled currently by the monetary interest only or there is something more here. I think what should be the priority now is to stop the aggression. And later we can we can talk about how to settle the settle the situation um, adequately. I think that the peace is very difficult in the region, especially that the history is in a way brutal, and the history is in a way um, the both sides somehow um, had losses in it. So um, I believe that the, the, the peace at this moment especially is a um, very difficult thing to talk about and I suppose that the current rhetoric should be focused on Azerbaijan stopping the aggression and after that we can talk about how to successfully implement the field, uh, the, the peace process. and. Um, the fact that Azerbaijan has, is not satisfied, obviously, with um, no progress with the, OST, uh, with the Minsk group and the peace process does not justify, just not that definitely does not justify the aggression. Everything that we read about the war, um, fictional and non-fictional, basically says that um, as soon as you go to the front line, your understanding of what is uh, might change. 
And I think we have a tendency in many countries to romanticize war, uh, not really thinking about the fact that I believe that the experience of the war from a, from a regular soldier, and I don't want to claim their experiences, but this is just how I imagine it, is that the war is, the war is dirty and the war is full of suffering on both sides, that we should be, uh, to some extent, be empathetic towards. I believe, on the other hand, that the soldiers that are in the front line, um, what is being at stake for them now is the safety and the existence of the country, of the families, and of people who they care about. And as again, just to repeat, um, Azerbaijan does not defend, because we have to really understand the difference between defending and, and being the aggressor. So Azerbaijan has, at this point, no one to defend, except maybe the, the ego of the, of the Aliyev's family. I see now like um, some commentaries under my post, which are coming from um, Turkish and Azeri citizens, and um, accusing me to some extent that Armenians paid me, Armenians that I'm brainwashed by the Armenians, uh, and I, I would like to also address that to some extent because um, I've been living in this country for many years and as a researcher specialized in Armenian issues, I am critical towards the Armenian culture in many, to, to a big extent. And I am critical towards certain aspects of Armenian government as well. But still, I was given the, the right to happily live here and continue my work for many years. And I'm not really sure if I was given the same amount of academic freedom if I was living in Azerbaijan and, or if I was living in, in Turkey. So I, I think we can come back to being this cold-hearted academic discussion and academic analysis as long as soon as the aggression is being stopped, then we can talk.